Good morning. <coughs> Welcome to Sunday morning. Uh, wherever you are, um, greetings for the those of you I can see on Zoom and those of you I can't see on Facebook and YouTube. Happy you're here. Um, I got a new thing just for this group. Check this out. I bought a bell. I've been going around like ringing and checking out bells waiting for just the right residence and I brought this one home last week. So anyway, enough of that. First I want to thank all the people who reached out to me over the last uh, 10 days or so. It's been a journey. Um, but I'm okay. And um, happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to be here next week, the day after Christmas. And the day after New Year's I will have um, Laura Cannon who is an outstanding meditation teacher, uh, will be leading this group. She is in Bethesda, Maryland. She's been teaching Dharma for about 10 years. Um, I met her in the meditation teacher training that I took. Um, I do her group on Monday nights um, out of Bethesda. She's pretty cool. So um, I will be traveling, so I don't know where I will be. <laughs> on January 2nd, um, but this group will happen, so, <sighs> today we're going to talk about um, really something that is a plague of the consciousness of the West, uh, the inner critic. We all experience that, we all negotiate with it, um, it's really um, endemic, at least in this culture, and I'll talk about the cultural piece of that a little later. But where I'd like to begin with that is the most frequent question I ever get regarding meditation is, am I doing it right? And the answer is, of course you are. The only way not to do it right is to not do it at all. Um, people tend to judge their experience um, based on some preconceived notion of whatever result they think they should be getting while they're meditating. And um, I've been sitting for 30 years and every meditation session is different. Sometimes my head gets really quiet. Sometimes it's romper room on steroids with the greatest hits of the 70s from when I worked in radio. It's all good. So. Um, we're going to talk about that part of the mind that tells you that you're doing it wrong. Um, but you are not doing it wrong. <laughs> you're just having this experience. And the point of mindfulness meditation is just to recognize that we're having this experience. And note it. And be aware of it. And be aware of what our mind is telling ourselves, telling us about it and recognizing that that is not necessarily so. So, why don't we start with meditation. So I invite you to find a comfortable posture. Um, a comfortable meditation posture is one in which you are um, upright if you're sitting. Um, if you're lying down it is suggested um, that you keep at least one arm or both at 90 degrees. That way if you fall asleep your arm will drop and you'll wake up. But if you're sitting upright, not like slouched, um, in a position that is attentive but relaxed. Just sort of letting your body settle into your pelvis area. And just 
lower your gaze so you look like you're looking down the bridge of your nose. Not straining, just like letting your gaze lower. And what that does is it relaxes the muscles around your eyes. And gently close your eyes. And let's start with a few slow, deep breaths. About three quarters. Just to connect our awareness, our awareness to the body breathing. And as you breathe out, just begin to relax and soften. Just settling in. And as you breathe out, relax the muscles in your face, around your eyes. Long, slow, deep breath in. Long, slow, relaxing exhale. And let your breathing return to normal. And as you breathe out, Continue to relax and soften your body. Just letting gravity do its thing. You settle into your seat. Relaxing your shoulders to the degree you can. Just relaxing your belly, soft belly. We walk around holding our belly in a lot. Sometimes we know we're doing it, sometimes we don't. Now we're just going to relax our belly, soft belly. Let it hang. I invite you to become aware of the touch points. Notice the sensation of your bottom on the chair. The sensations of your feet touching the floor. Just bringing your attention into your body through noticing what it feels like to be in this body. Notice the sensations of your hands resting in your lap or wherever they're resting. Let your attention come to the sensations of the body breathing. Not trying to control the breath. Just watching it and keeping your focus there as best you can.
some people direct their focus to the sensations of the air moving in and out of the nose. Some people focus on the sensations of the chest or the belly moving in and out or up and down. And for some, the focus is on just the overall global sensation of the body breathing. It just lets your awareness focus and rest on your awareness of the breath and the body breathing. If your mind wanders off, oh, not if, your mind wanders off, you notice that you're thinking. Notice that you've noticed. Notice the phenomenon of thinking without going down the road with whatever narrative or issue or subject the thinking mind is presenting. Just noticing the phenomenon of thinking. In your mind's eye, you can bow to it. And bring your awareness back to the sensations of breathing. You may be able to hold that awareness for some period of time, or it may be fleeting before you notice you've wandered off in thought again. It's all good. The point is not to just quiet the mind. The point is to be aware of what it's doing. And to the degree you can, just let the sinking the thinking mind settle. The way sediment settles at the bottom of a still pool. Rest your awareness on the breath and the sensations of the body breathing.
thoughts arise, they come and go. You can watch them come and go. Without getting involved in the content, thoughts like little baubles moving through space. If you can, you can notice who's noticing these thoughts. And return your awareness to the sensations of the body breathing.
Just breathing in, breathing out. Noticing your awareness and bringing your focus to the sensations of the body breathing. And as we come towards the end of this sitting, I invite you to notice whatever your experience is of this moment. Maybe it may be that this practice, this meditation, helps you look out into the world through kind eyes. Helps you to meet yourself with compassion and kindness that you can then radiate out into your interactions as you move around in the world or as you encounter people however you encounter them. And may it be that the benefits of this practice benefit everyone in your surroundings, all the people in your household, all the people in your neighborhood, all the people in your town.
make the benefits of this practice be of benefit to all beings everywhere. May all beings be happy. May all beings be well. May all beings be safe. May all beings be at ease and at peace. And may we all contribute to that. Thank you for your practice and welcome. Hmm. I'll put the usual information in the chat, um, information on how to contact me, uh, my website. Um, all of these meditations and talks are archived on YouTube, so there's that link also. And of course, Everything I do here is freely given. And there's a, a link if you feel moved to make a donation. This is not a solicitation. <laughs> Just if you feel moved to do so. So. When the Dalai Lama first came to America, I love this story, and people have heard me tell it a lot. He was giving, he was doing a lecture tour, and he was in Los Angeles. <coughs> Excuse me. And Sharon Salzberg, who's one of the founding teachers of the Insight Meditation Society in Massachusetts, approached him and asked, "How come you never talk about self-esteem?" And His Holiness the Dalai Lama honestly didn't know what she was talking about. So she explained it. And it made him cry because it had never occurred to him that people would feel bad about themselves. This is a man who lived in exile, who lost his country, whose life was under threat, who was forced to march across the Himalayas from Tibet to India and it never occurred to him to feel bad about himself, and it never occurred to him that people do that. I think that's an important teaching. Because here in the West, we do it all the time. Um, I've talked at some length in these sessions about the nature of the thinking mind. It's sort of, there's a part of it that sort of just like runs on all the time. I refer to it as the radio station of the mind. And it defaults negative. Now there's actual neurobiology behind that, evolutionary neurobiology behind that. Um, there's a part of our hippocampus right at the back of the brain um, that's wired for believing that we are in danger. It's the oldest part of the brain. It comes from when we were crawling out of the primordial ooze, something more like a tadpole, um, without much circuitry other than enough to move around and to intuitively know that we were in danger. And fast forward however millennia later, that part of us is still here and it exerts some influence. And the reason why I'm telling you that part is so when you notice that your mind is going there, that's not an opportunity to say, oh, I'm doing it wrong. Um, or to beat yourself up in any way is just a natural process. And once we become aware of it, it's easier to address it. And the whole issue of self-doubt goes all the way back to the beginning um, of the Buddha's experience of awakening. Beyond that, um, I've told this story before, I love this story, 
At the moment, Buddha was about to awaken, sitting in front of the, Mo the sitting under the Bodhi tree. Um, the god of illusion, Mara, appeared and tried to stop the awakening. And after spending three days hurling everything she could, or he could, depending on which scripture you're reading, to stop the awakening and failing, reached into his most potent weapon and hurled self-doubt. What makes you think you're someone who can? And Buddha blew that off and looked right at all of his stuff embodied in Mara, all of it, and said, I see you, Mara. Let's have tea. So the reason why that's an important story, at least for me, is it instructs us not to avoid that part of us that is constantly telling us we're doing it wrong, but to look right at it and be gentle and come to know the nature of it. Because that part of the mind is kind of resent, uh, relentless. <laughs> it goes on and it will target anything about us and tell us that we're not okay. How we look, what we eat, how, you know, our work, how we play, how we spend our time. I watch too much television. I don't watch enough television. I spend too much time reading. I don't read enough. How we come across to people, how we meditate, how often, whether we're doing it right. It's just this ongoing inner critic. It's endless. And the thing about it, if you really notice it, if you spend some time, it's a good exercise, spend some time noticing and looking at it and listening to it, here are some things you'll notice about it. Um, it can never stay on topic. It's always flitting around from one thing to the next. It's always in the past telling you that that was bad. You should have done it different. Or in the future, predicting some sort of disaster or screw up. Generally casting dispersions. <laughs> and, you know, it's always some form of greed or aversion. I need this, I need this, or I don't want that, or I don't want that, or some version of doubt. And when I've talked about this with some people, they talk about, you know, well, you know, it's okay to, you know, don't you need to critique your behavior, your work, your stuff? It says, of course you do. Um, but this is not a critique, <laughs> okay? Um, a cr critique is uh, constructive. It's constructive criticism about something specific that is designed to aid us into doing it better. Um, this is not that. This is just an ongoing negative commentary. And the inner critic tends to make global statements about how bad we are and then uses the latest incidents of whatever went wrong to just back that up. For example, I lock my keys in the car with the motor running. Anybody else ever do that? <laughs> People look like, oh, um, but I did it twice in one week, <laughs> right? And, um, you know, if you bring AAA out for the same thing twice in one week, you have to pay them the second time. So, of course, in the back of my mind, you know, I'm hearing, Ken, you are such an idiot. No, it's not true. I just, like, did this thing. But that's where my mind goes immediately. Um, I call someone and they don't call me back and the critic starts rolling about how I'm not okay and this person is going to get rid of me and people get rid of me and, you know, that's just old crap from childhood. And we're so used to it that we don't even notice it. <laughs> we barely notice it at all and we just assume that it's us. And it's not. It's not even your voice. If you look at your conditioning, it's in someone else's handwriting. Um, I have two principal voices that come up from this. Um, one is that I am heading for disaster at 90 miles an hour. And that's the voice of my mother who had tremendous anxiety and lived her life frightened and 
strung out and believing that things are not going to be okay. And the other voice um, is, oh, Ken, you're screwing up again. That's my dad. I can never do anything right in front of him. I was at a meditation retreat at Cloud Mountain, which is a meditation um, retreat center 90 miles north of Portland, Oregon. It's beautiful out there in the woods. You know, these meditation retreats, they're all out in the middle of nowhere. And it's like day three or four of ten days. And it's out in the deep forest. It's right after it rains. So it's like lush and beautiful. And I'm sitting out on this deck in the woods and I'm meditating. And in my head I hear, you're screwing up. I actually hear it. I'm <laughs> like, oh my god, what can I possibly be screwing up here? I am literally just sitting here and doing nothing else. And I'm sitting here for only one reason, and that is just to sit here. And it was like a seeing Mara naked in front of me moment. So it just, it's relentless. It shows up anywhere you want and anywhere it wants. You know, I refer to it as the radio station of the mind. WSKU. It's noon, you're screwed. You know, in meditation practice, the most frequent question that I get is, am I doing it right? I think I'm not. And of course you're doing it right. People tell me they can't get the mind to be quiet. The mind doesn't go quiet. We're developing a different relationship with the noise. A different relationship with this part of the noise, which is really important. The part of the noise that tells us that we're not okay. And every time we engage it, we strengthen it. If we start going down the road believing um, what the inner critic is telling us, um, that just makes it stronger. But there are legitimate things that are not okay. And I'm not suggesting we just blow off every concern we have. What I'm suggesting is some discernment. When I took the motorcycle safety training course, they showed me a picture of a motorcycle from up above. And there's these two wings coming off the side. And that's the zone where the truck driver cannot see you. <laughs> right? It's a reasonable fear to not want to ride in that zone. That's not my inner critic telling me that I'm screwing up. It's a reasonable fear. Um, it's a reasonable fear when I hear my mind say, don't step out in front of a moving train. Okay. But there are other voices that sound similar to that, which always has some ver version of, well, what if things don't work out? I hear that all the time. I hear, I hear it in my head. I hear it from other people. What if that doesn't work? Well, how about, what if it does? What if things do, in fact, work out? Some of you know I used to be a journalist. In a way, I still am. Once you are, you always are. And I was working at the San Francisco Chronicle, and I was hating it. <laughs> I mean, I loved it when I got there. I was really excited to get to like a large media outlet and everything that goes along with that. Um, but I really started to hate it towards the end, but I didn't think I could do anything else. The voice in my head, the inner critic was telling me, you have this set of skills, you have this specific set of skills, you can't do anything else with it, you were just sort of consigned to a life of being miserable in your work. And I believed that for some period of time. It's just the inner critic telling me I can't do anything. Uh, I ended up quitting that job and going back to school and getting a, a psych degree and a license as a therapist. And a lot of those skills have turned out, the listening skills, the interviewing skills, the discernment skills, the helping draw people out, um, apply. So Mara was lying to me, because Mara's always lying to me, that I couldn't do anything else. And I loved that work for 25 years and then retired. And I'm doing this now and I'm having a great time. So how do we meet this? Because it's, it's ongoing. How do we meet this? 
The Buddha offered some good wisdom on this in the Dharmapada. He said, if one knew oneself to be precious, one would guard oneself with care. The sage will always watch over herself or himself in any part of the night, if one knew oneself to be precious. And later on in that same piece, he says, don't give up your own welfare for the sake of others' welfare, however great. Clearly know your own welfare and be intent on the highest good. Now I've said over and over that we have to repeat these things to ourselves all the time. I keep coming back to the quote from my friend Jeannie Dupro who wrote, so I remind myself as often as I must, which is quite often. We're not going to walk away from a Dharma talk or a therapy session or a 12-step meeting and have it all. But we will have heard it and we can remind ourselves that when we hear the inner critic saying whatever your version of it is, it's okay to say, oh, I'm okay. Because our thoughts are real, but they are not true. They're real in that we hear them, but they're not true in that they're not truths. And what if we met this part of ourselves as we would meet a frightened child? There's a whole movement around the inner child that happened in the 90s. And I believe in that metaphor. And developmentally, we are everyone we've been along the line. But when we hear that, part of us is telling us we're not okay, we're doing it wrong, we're heading in the wrong direction, however that manifests. What if we meet that as a child with its arms open, asking to be loved? And I mean, what does a frightened child need? Love, openness, gentleness, reassurance, self-compassion. I don't think I've gotten through any one of these talks without coming back to self-compassion at some point. Because that's the thread that runs through everything I teach. We can't necessarily make it stop. Because I mean, we might, but you know, it might take years of, and years and years, but we can change how we relate to it. We can meet ourselves with gentleness and kindness and reassurance that, oh, this is difficult, but I'm still okay. I'm navigating a difficult passage right now. Some of you know about that. And I have to keep reminding myself, oh, I'm okay, this is just hard. And not to mistake, this is hard with, I'm not okay, because life gets hard sometimes. And reassure myself that, okay, I'm okay, I'm just navigating this process. And one thing that helps with this is to focus on what's happening now in this moment. The inner critic is almost never focused on the present moment. It's not going to tell you, except, you know, that one moment when I was sitting out there meditating. But that's kind of rare, at least in my experience. What's happening now? I'm sitting here with y'all um, in my well-lit room in my with my blue walls that I really like. When I moved into this house, the previous owner had painted this room blue. It was like, oh, I'm keeping that. Um, I'm enjoying this. I'm physically comfortable. Okay. My mind is telling me, oh, you're boring them to sleep and they're not going to come back. You know, not really at this moment, but I hear that. This isn't going to be effective. You blah, 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 blah. It's all me, 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 me. I don't know anybody who teaches who doesn't deal with that. And some of them are the most effective and best teachers I know. So, kindness, I'm okay. I'm doing the best I can. It's good enough. And contemplate what you actually know to be true. <laughs> okay? Not the assumptions that Mara is spreading around in the hamster wheel of the mind. 
what do I actually know to be true? I know that I'm safe and well in this moment. What else do I need? So in the end, as always, this comes back to an opportunity for self-compassion. As do all things. One of the cool things about mindfulness practice is it helps us notice when we're doing this. It helps us notice that, oh, the mind is doing that. There's a lot of debate on what Buddhism is, right? Um, and I buy into all of it. But one of the ones that I like is it's a science of the mind. It's a learning to observe the mind. I like that. That works for me. Practicing mindfulness is like strengthening a muscle. And one of the muscles we're strengthening is we're learning to observe the mind when it goes to this space and decide and know that this is not where we live, this is not who we are, it's just a phenomenon that, of the way the mind does its thing. So, I invite you to remember that you are well and okay and a good person and doing the best you can and it's good enough. And I invite you to remind yourself of that as often as you need to and know that that too is okay. So, I thank you for your kind attention. Welcome to the new people. Nice to see you. Anybody have any questions or comments? Hi, Ken. It's Kitty. Can we see the bell? We heard the bell. Can we see it? Can you hear that? I can hear it. The bell. Oh, beautiful. I bought this bell and it's got... It's yeah, really cool. I've been going around checking out bells. And um, <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I collect wooden flutes also. And it's not really like you're looking for it as much as it is like you're waiting for it. And this one really resonated, so I brought it home. Uh, if you haven't been there yet, on 10th Street in, Street in Jeffersonville is a place called Happy's Meditation Store. Um, it's easy to find. There's a huge totem pole right out in the front. Um, I got it there. And then ha run by a guy named Happy. He's a cool dude. So, I thank you all for your kind attention this morning. And I look forward to seeing you all next week.